Hello everyone. In today's lecture we are going to take a look at what we're calling global atmospheric changes. So the term that I'm using is intentionally a little bit more broad than just saying climate change because while climate change is of course the sort of the, the primary focus of what's currently happening with the ever warming global temperature in the atmosphere, there are other changes to consider as well and things that we need to talk about. So in this particular lecture again we'll talk um, just very briefly about the relationship between the atmosphere and climate. For more information about the atmosphere, please make sure that you have watched the air pollution lecture. So in that particular lecture, I go into a little bit more detail about the atmosphere. Then we're going to talk through again what these sort of three different impacts on the atmosphere and the changes that we've been seeing. So the first will be climate change, the second will be ozone depletion, and then we'll touch a little bit on acid deposition. So let's talk a little bit first about the difference between weather and climate, uh, because one of the things that you will often hear climate skeptics or, or, or climate change deniers, one of the things that you'll often hear them say is, well, how can we have a, you know, a warming climate if we have instances like two winters ago when we had a, a, a massive cold air moving in from the Arctic that gave us, you know, negative 50 degree wind chills and it, it was record breaking. So the argument there, and you'll hear this quite a bit, is, you know, how can we have a, 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 a global warming, if you will, when we have periods of, of really, really cold weather? Okay, well, important here, important point. Let's talk about the difference between weather and climate. Your weather uh, is what's happening in the atmosphere on any given day and at any given time. And it changes. It can, changes consistently from hour to hour and day to day. So when you want to know what to wear that particular day or how to dress, you're checking your weather, right? What's it going to be like? It's just one snapshot in time of particular atmospheric conditions. And those conditions include the temperature, they include, include uh, chances of precipitation, uh, what the cloudiness level is, whether it's humid, whether it's windy, all of those types of things. So again, the weather influences our day-to-day -day decisions in how we are, again, dressing to go outside. Uh, if you're a farmer, you have to pay attention to the weather to note whether it's a good day to uh, get your crops in the ground or whether it's a good day to harvest. Um, so there's lots of, of different things that we use weather for in general. And again, it's very useful to know what the weather's going to be like on any given day. But that's not the same thing as a climate or as the climate uh, or a region's climate as we call it. A region's climate is the typical weather pattern that occurs in place over a very, very, very long period of time. And it's determined by temperature and precipitation. And these are long-term averages. This isn't just the weather one day or even one week. This is what we expect the temperature to be on this day because years and years of historical records have told us that on average, this is what the weather is going to be like. And so using that information, we can actually get a sense of what our climate is. So here in the uh, Midwest United States, um, our climate is we tend to have uh, warm and rainy summers. Uh, that's typically followed by uh, cool to cold winters that can be, again, moderately snowy um, in, in average years to, um, to be getting a fair amount of snow uh, other years. So we know that if we live in Chicago, we should expect to get snow in the winter. Uh, that's part of our climate. And we also know that we should expect some, some thunderstorms in the summer, right? So that's, that's part of knowing our climate and knowing what's here. If you move to another part of the country, if you move to the Southwest United States and you live in New Mexico, the climate in New Mexico is a lot different than the climate here. So you can expect New Mexico to have a much different climate. There's going to be a lot less precipitation, very little rain. Uh, the temperatures are going to be a lot different. You'll have extremely hot, dry summers, and you will have um, uh, winters that are still warm and perhaps a little bit of precipitation. So again, the climate tells us about what to expect on average in a region. It is not just what's happening a single point in time. And it's important to, again, 
note the difference between those because that's something you hear a lot when people are trying to argue against climate change is how can you have these periodic um, historical cold spells and still have a global planet that's the uh, temperature that's warming well it's very possible and let's talk about why that is so as I said um, we've got lots of different climates here on earth it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, we have uh, climates all over and those climates change as you go from the equator and then extend to the poles on either side and um, the sort of these broad regions where we have characteristic uh, plants and animals that live in those uh, regions, we refer to those as um, these different types of biomes, for example. So in the desert southwest, that's a, that's a desert biome, right? So we have animals and plants that we associate with deserts. And then you have the, the biomes of, of the Midwest, where a, what we call a temperate grassland biome. So we have different animals and plants here. These are animals and plants that are well adapted to our climate. So um, they have been here long enough that they plant snow when to leaf out in the spring and they know when to put their flowers out so that the pollinators can come and pollinate them and the insects know when to essentially come out of um, their 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 winter um, resting phase and they know when to emerge uh, and there's gonna be food available and all of this is based on again these historical averages we have of temperature and precipitation when you change those things when the plants flower too early or the insects come out too soon because the weather's getting warmer and warmer earlier in the year, it can lead to extinction in some cases, or it can at the very least lead to what we're calling ecosystem degradation. Things aren't the same. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, quickly go through this. Again, you can learn more about the atmosphere um, in the previous lecture. We know that the, the amount of the sunshine or, or what we're calling insulation is a, is a big determinant of climate because it makes um, liquid water, right? So our, our water is not frozen uh, up in, in polar ice caps like we see uh, on potentially um, other planets in the past. We have uh, a warm planet that's hospitable to life. We're able to carry out uh, photosynthesis, green things are. It's what drives the oceans and the wind currents and, and powers our, our cycles. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. This is kind of an interesting graphic. If you look at all of the solar radiation that enters, uh, hits the planet, 31% of it is reflected back into space, and 69% of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, the land, and the water. So most of that absorption um, is what's being headed up by oceans and lands, for example. So precipitation is water that falls from the atmosphere. I'm not going to go through that. Um, you can sort of look over that on your, on your own. But let's sort of get back to this concept of what's going on with our global climate. Earth's average temperature is continuing to increase, and that increase is a fairly steady increase year by year by year. Um, how we know this is we have a whole host of different meteorological stations, weather balloons, sea surface buoys, you name it. Uh, everything around the world and all the data is telling us that the Earth's global average temperature continues to increase. As a matter of fact, we know that nine of the ten highest global temperatures ever recorded have happened in the last 15 years. So. At the end of 2019, there was a, a, new, a new record warmth sort of average temperature for planet Earth, and it seems almost on a continual basis, year after year, we continue to hit those uh, new records, if you will. There's a consequence to that. The consequence to that is that here in the Northern Hemisphere, spring is earlier. Uh, it's coming earlier uh, even than it was, you know, 60 years ago, uh, and autumn's coming later. So the weather is getting warmer sooner, and it's getting cooler later. And that might not sound like a big deal, but once again, if you are a living thing that has a life cycle that is based on very specific expectations for temperature, so, you know, to emerge at this time to have the best chance of being able to get food and find a mate and have offspring. If you're wrong, even by just a day or two, it could have dramatic consequences for living things. There's been other consequences of this warm weather. So the, the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. 
and the more moisture it can hold, what we see is we see um, uh, more serious storms. So uh, hurricanes are, are gaining in strength and they're happening more often. We see increases in heat waves and heat related deaths. We have glaciers that are continuing to retreat more. We have sea levels rising. All of those things are phenomenon that are directly related to what's happening. So this is a, a nice graphic by NOAA and this is um, showing you so that the black line in the middle here is what you could call so sort of the global uh, temperature, uh, what we're going to call anomaly. But what this means is, is let's assume zero is the normal global average temperature. Okay, so let's say this is the, the long term average over the past several hundred years. This is what we would expect. So this is sort of our, our zero line. And you can see that there were some some cool periods, some brief cool periods, uh, just before kind of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You can kind of see that we were that the planet was slightly cooler than, than what we would expect. But once we started industrializing and once we had fossil fuels starting to be burned and consumed on a regular basis, you can see that the trend line here has been essentially up. And you're looking at a couple of different uh, lines here. You're looking at the, the land um, is sort of in this brownish color. And then you're looking at the, the blue uh, is the oceans. And then together, um, it would be sort of the, the planetary, again, anomaly or how much we're off, if you want to think of it that way. And as you can see, uh, especially uh, over the last 20 years, the land temperature in particular has really, really spiked up higher and higher and higher. So what we know, and when I say we, this is, this is scientists, uh, there is a, a consensus that 97% of all scientists will tell you that human activities are responsible for climate change, that it's, it's not just a, a natural phenomenon. Yes, the planet has warmed and cooled at lots of different points in our history, but it's never warmed this fast before. And that's what's so alarming. Um, the um, United Nations uh, IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, predicts that we could see anywhere between a three to seven degree Fahrenheit increase in global temperatures by the year 2100. We're going to higher maximum temperatures, excuse me, temperatures, more hot days, fewer cold days. There'll be an increase in the heat index. Remember, the heat index is how hot it feels outside. So it's a combination of um, the, the temperature and the amount of moisture in the air. So it's going to be more humid and more sticky. Humidity is a problem. It's hard to cool off when it is humid. In a dry heat, your body sweats. And that sweat can evaporate and it cools you down. In a humid heat, you can't do that. The, um, the, the amount of moisture that's in the air prevents that sweat from evaporating at the same rate. And so you feel hotter longer, which can lead to more heat strokes and deaths. And then we also expect to see, again, changes in precipitation patterns. In general, places that are wet are only going to get wetter and places that are dry are only going to get drier. That's sort of been what we've seen uh, on average. So what is it that's happening? So human activities are directly related to the combustion of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, all of those things contribute to a group of uh, gases that we particularly call greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases include things like ones we're familiar with, carbon dioxide. But they also include things that you may be a little less familiar with, nitrous oxides and methane. So these greenhouse gases, oh, as well as some uh, CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the moment, um, ground level ozone and, and water. And again, water's pretty steady. It's it's not really impacted by human activity, but, but water does absorb um, heat also and keeps some of that heat in. So the one that we're most concerned about, um, uh, nitrous oxides and, and um, um, methane are very potent greenhouse gases, but they're not being emitted in quite the same quantities that carbon dioxide is. Carbon dioxide is the big one because we're releasing so much of it. And even if you remember at the beginning of the lecture when we were talking about uh, the atmosphere and air pollution, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is very, very, very small. It's only, it's like half a percent um, is, is what we find. However, 
because these greenhouse gases essentially act as a thermal blanket and they trap heat, even small changes in the amount that we find in the atmosphere can have large consequences. So once again, we're looking at another graphic. This time we are charting the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. And what you can see is, so there's um, variation between summer and winter, and that's sort of why the graph goes up and down and up and down. But again, if you follow the trend line since the 1960s of the last 60 years, that line is uh, continuing to increase. It's, it's going, um, uh, increasing uh, more and more uh, every decade. So that has a result or an impact then of lots of different things. So sea levels are rising. Water expands when it warms number one, and number two, polar ice caps and, and continental glacier melts are adding more water to the systems as well. We see more droughts, we see more floods. Fresh water uh, is becoming more scarce in those areas that continue to see long-term droughts, like parts of the desert southwest, for example. You have entire uh, island nations that are at risk of being underwater in the near, very near future. You have island nations that have been built at sea level or only a few feet above sea level. And once sea levels begin to rise, they have nowhere to go. They, they can't retreat to higher ground. There is no higher ground. So their entire nation, as they know it, will be wiped out and they will be some of these casualties of what's currently happening. We also have impacts on agriculture. So, um, a lot of food is grown um, in and around uh, what we call deltas. So deltas are places where uh, river systems basically empty into um, the ocean. And we often have very fertile land in that area and it's land that's good for farming. When sea levels rise, that, that land becomes underwater and it's no longer uh, farm uh, worthy. Pests become more prevalent. They can move um, from areas um, they're where they're limited right now based on maybe precipitation or temperature. With warmer temperature and more precipitations, these pests can move out of tropical areas and they can move into more temperate areas and cause a lot of damage. And then of course there's an impact on us as humans. We have more heat related illnesses. Uh, mosquitoes are expanding their range because again this is a, a tropical insect that likes tropical conditions. They like warm, they like wet. When you have more warm and wet conditions, you can spread, and you're also spreading the parasites that you're carrying, including malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, uh, Zika virus. So there's all kinds of different things that, that can happen. And then of course we have the impact on other living things. So it's not just humans, uh, and it's not just people, but it's also our planet that's at stake here. So we have um, fungal diseases that become more common in living things. We have a lot of impacts on the oceans in particular. So um, the more carbon dioxide we release into the atmosphere, some of that carbon is currently being absorbed by the oceans themselves. Um, when when the, the, the carbon dioxide actually is absorbed by ocean water, it's this process that produces something called carbonic acid. So the oceans are becoming more warm and more acidic, and that acidic, uh, the acidity is very harmful to uh, uh, life in the ocean, specifically corals, which coral reefs themselves are a hotbed for living things. That means there's, there's so many living things that rely on active, healthy corals. And unfortunately, what we're seeing instead is we're seeing corals die out because they can't withstand those acidic temperatures. So again, this is just the um, acidity levels. So this is just a comparison of, of what we saw in, in 95 and what we expect to see uh, in, in the next uh, 75 to 80 years. Again, uh, areas that are blue and green are cooler waters where again, typically we have um, less, um, less acid uh, acidity, um, so less of that absorption of uh, the carbonic acid, if you will. Uh, in the next 75 to 80 years, we expect that to increase globally worldwide. Uh, and the acidity levels in the ocean is going to continue to increase and it will have a, a lot of potentially devastating impacts. All right, so once again, we know what the problem is. What do we do? There's two approaches here. Uh, the first approach is something called mitigation. And in mitigation, we are moderating or postponing the effects by reducing our greenhouse emissions, because that's what it comes down to. In order to tackle this problem, we have to stop producing 
so much greenhouse gas. That's the way that we have to handle this. The other way to deal with global climate change is to adapt. So in the case of adaptation, we're saying there's not much we can do about the consequences right now, but at the very least, we can respond to these changes and try to stay on top of them. In reality, the uh, future is going to have to hold both. We're, we're going to have to both adapt to things that we can't change, that it's too late to change at this point, but we also need to do whatever we can to mitigate the consequences. Uh, and that means specifically focusing on reducing our carbon dioxide uh, emissions. What does that mean? Well, in practical senses, we need to, number one, reduce our energy use overall, globally, everyone, uh, but especially those countries that produce the most carbon dioxide. We need to really take the initiative and we need to be the ones pushing forward on that. We need to work on developing alternatives to fossil fuels. Um, we need to plant and maintain forests. So again, trees, plants are, are carbon absorbers, right? They suck in that carbon dioxide to make food. The more trees we have, um, the, the, the better we can slow the impacts of what's happening. However, at the same time we're putting out more carbon dioxide, we're also cutting down trees. So um, it's kind of a, a double whammy, if you will, for the environment. And um, both of those can have very um, difficult uh, consequences for the future. We also need to be more proactive about managing our carbon. So in the case of uh, industries where we, we don't have the option to use less energy uh, or use alternatives, we need to be able to deal with that carbon in different ways. Um, carbon sequestration is something that has been discussed for a while. It's not necessarily something that's new. It's the idea of taking carbon dioxide and essentially injecting it deep in the ground as a kind of a, a holding cell, if you will. Again, it's not new, um, but the problem with it is is, is, is extremely, extremely expensive. Um, the, the, the cost of taking, for example, a traditional coal-fired power plant and, and retrofitting it so that you uh, could have this type of technology where instead of the carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere, you're actually, uh, again, injecting it into some sort of deep geological formation has been essentially cost prohibited. Um, you can't make enough money selling your electricity uh, in order to be able to pay for this technology. So there are certainly some stumbling blocks along the way. Adaptation includes things like moving away from the coasts, um, constructing seawalls, um, trying to find substitute crops. So there's a, a lot of different ways here that we could look at. We know what the consequences are, we know what's going to happen, and here's how we're going to prepare for that. The problems are not just um, local. Obviously, this is, this is a global issue, and this is why it requires global cooperation in order to, to find a solution to this. And so what we're going to see in the future is we need to see developed countries really leading the way, because developed countries are the ones that are emitting the most carbon dioxide. So if you look at CO2 emissions per capita, and per capita simply means per person. So if you take all 335 million people in the United States and you divide up the amount of carbon dioxide the United States produces, this is um, about, so this is um, in, in um, tons per year, metric tons per year, you would see that the United States, actually United States, Australia, and Canada, we kind of all switch flip and flop places. Um, sometimes Australia is number one, sometimes we're number one, sometimes Canada is number one. So these sort of us three here at the top were kind of the ones that sort of, um, um, again, kind of trade that tile back and forth, if you will. Um, but you can see how this compares to other places, um, different European countries, for example, different places in Asia, different places in Africa. So again, we're really the ones, these, are, these industrialized nations are the ones that really need to step forward and to accept it's our responsibility to get this done. And that's not easy right now. Um, but hopefully in the future, as things change, it will be. Um, since I'm running long on time here, um, I'm going to just very briefly talk about ozone depletion. We don't talk about the ozone a lot, but um, 30, 25, 30 years ago, um, 
the ozone and the hole in the ozone was a really big deal. Um, we know that the ozone is important for protecting us from UV radiation, so it's, it's incredibly important. More radiation will get through if the ozone layer isn't whole and intact. It's been thinning. It occurs naturally over Antarctica, but it's become worse because of human activity. Um, over Antarctica, there's been about a 70% reduction in ozone levels there and about a 10% in reduction in Europe and North America. So um, the good news about ozone is we know exactly what was causing it. It was caused by um, chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere. Uh, they're from a whole bunch of different products, if you will. What happens is that they um, uh, interact with the ozone layer and basically break it down, if you will. They make the ozone layer unstable. So what we did is we said, hey, in the late 70s, we accepted that this is what was going on and we banned it worldwide. So um, CFCs were banned as propellants um, in the U.S. and then in the 80s, everyone began to develop them and phase them out. So the nice thing here is this is an environmental success story. Globally, when we have a problem and we recognize that problem, we can come together and come up with a solution. And the ozone uh, is an example of that. We expect it to fully recover uh, sometime in the next 25 to 30 years. So that is a huge success story. Um, I'm going to pause there. You can read more about acid deposition um, in the lecture notes that are provided with this. So again, this is sort of a, a little bit of an older issue, not something we talk about acid rain very much anymore. Um, but again, Again, um, I'm giving you the information, so we're just going to go ahead and pause there.